Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. This year, the Victoria Literary Arts Festival celebrated its 10th anniversary with three times the number of authors and nearly twice the number of events as last year. The lineup of 28 authors presented a variety of novelists, poets, and nonfiction writers from Canada, the United Kingdom, Ireland, France, Australia, the U.S., and Japan. Audiences could attend readings, themed discussions, onstage interviews and conversations, in venues throughout downtown Victoria, including art galleries, heritage sites, gardens, and major theaters. Our interest in culture and cultural production led us to look into the festival. In an age when books are beginning to appear passé and low-tech, we have found that literature continues to influence culture. Even in high-tech cyberspace, book clubs, quotations from favorite authors, and lists of best reads prevail. Reading is still popular and still a part of what constructs culture. In a way, one could view the World Wide Web as both reproducing literature and creating more varied forms of literature. After all, much of the web is text-based and requires both good reading and writing abilities to make the experience worthwhile. Festivals, such as the annual event here in Victoria, provide an opportunity for readers to meet their favorite authors and to become apprised of the latest good reads. We were not disappointed. Among the wonderful writers in this year's lineup was Pico Iyer. Ironically, it was Surfing the Net that first introduced us to Pico's work. Several quotes by him are popular among bloggers, that is, people who write online journals. The first quote we read by him remains our favorite. Quote, May we remember as we log on that half the world's people have never used a telephone and recall as we chatter that most of those around us have no chance to speak or move as they choose, close quote. Seeing his name on the Literary Arts Festival list prompted us to investigate his writings further. We were excited by what we found. Like us, Mr. Iyer has spent a great deal of time contemplating culture, power, and the global community. His work has a personal flavor, and his insights into the nature of culture within a global community are sensitive and even hopeful at times. He sees commonality even among difference. Unlike us, he has traveled quite a bit. His writings are most often categorized as travel writing. Born in Oxford, England to Indian parents, moving to Southern California at the age of seven, and crisscrossing the world as an adult, Mr. Iyer has called himself a Nowherian someone who does not quite fit into the preconceived cultural categories. This makes him a different kind of travel writer. His writing, like his travels and his cultural background, is hard to contain in just one genre. This year he came to Victoria to highlight his latest book, Abandon, which is his second novel. After we investigated his work, we knew we wanted to talk to him. We inquired and were excited to have our request for an interview granted. When we met with Mr. Iyer, we were delighted to find a gentle soul whose one-to-one -one persona did not differ at all from the sensitivity of his words in print. He generously sat and discussed the ins and outs of the future of the global village in troubled times, the place of literature and culture, and the ways in which writing, interacting, and traveling can make the world a better place to be. These contemplations seem important in a time when wars, conflicts, and disputes seem to be rooted in cultural differences and misunderstandings. In addition, Traveling the globe is easier than ever, but it is also more fraught with problems than ever. Attacks on tourists, global health threats such as the recent SARS crisis, and environmental concerns regarding fossil fuel usage provide layers of complexity to the idea of travel. Reminiscent of the archetype of the stranger, or the concept of the other, the traveler occupies a position that is both outside and inside social discourse. More than a voyeur, the traveler changes the destination by visiting it. 
Today on First Person Plural, we consider the place of the traveler in an episode we call He's a Real Nowhereian. You are a noted traveler, someone who has moved and spoken freely in many venues, and someone who has reflected upon other places and other cultures. Your words suggest that there is great variation among people and that these variations create classes of haves and have-nots. The events of the last year or two seem to be rooted in culture clashes, especially among cultures with varying degrees of power and with horrifying results. Is there a common ground where people from different and unequal backgrounds can meet? How do we celebrate our differences without the celebration leading to deadly conflicts? Well, I very much think there is a, co a common ground. And uh, I think all of us who travel have had the experience of suddenly finding yourself in Mongolia or Vancouver or San Francisco or whatever, surrounded by people with whom we don't share a common language, and instantly finding we can communicate through a smile, through body language, through just something fundamentally human. And I think travel always reassures me in my faith in humanity, both in my sense that in the poorest parts of the world people are amazingly kind and people who seem to have nothing lavish everything on those of us from very affluent places, but also affirms my sense in humanity in the sense of uh, being reminded of that we have as much in common as we have apart. And in fact, in uh, the new novel that I just brought out called Abandon, uh, a few years ago, as I was living in California, while Washington was ostensibly at war with radical or political Islam, I read, as many people have read, that the single most popular poet in America, then and now, is an Islamic poet, Rumi, the great Sufi mystic from the 13th century. And so I thought that even as we were concentrating so much on all that Washington and the Islamic world didn't share, here were Americans turning in their time of need to an Islamic poet, and that suggested exactly, to go back to your question, this place of commonness, and insofar as there might be any re resolution between these two forces, it seemed to exist maybe in the cultural plane. I feel that politically, governments and institutions are always defined by their interests and their ideologies, and always thinking about us versus them. But culturally and on an individual level, I think we're much more fascinated by the other, and I've tried to stress um, what, what brings us together rather than what pulls us apart. Do you think, I like that kind of, I don't want to call it a dichotomy, but kind of contrasting the political to the cultural. Mm. And that's one thing that we've thought about a lot in our work is that there is, that working in politics or working towards political solutions often don't work out because they're about you against me, mm. they, they're kind of us, them mentality in it. So in your travels, when you're talking about connecting with people from different cultures, do you sometimes feel that otherness? I mean, are you aware of ways other than fighting or conflicting that you can respect that otherness without destroying it or mucking it into, you know, like blurring it to where it doesn't exist anymore? Yeah, yes, because I think when I tra to travel is to be drawn towards otherness. The act of traveling is to be fascinated by the other, something different from what you have at home, and to be pulled into it and pulled into the mystery and, 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 and romance of something you don't understand. And what you also find, and what I find constantly when I travel, is that most of the people I meet are fascinated by the otherness of me. To, to them, I'm this exotic coming from this land of plenty, um, and the closest they can get to this country that often they dream about. So more specifically, when I've been in the Middle East, for example, or almost anywhere, I find that the people I meet are not are often quite suspicious of or hostile to America, the Washington government, and yet the same people are, of course, fascinated by American culture, long to see American movies, long to make American friends. Some of them actually long to become Americans themselves. And so while they think of America as their formal enemy, inside their hearts and especially in their imaginations, they're devouring everything of America that they can get. 
And then when I come back from those trips to California, I find my friends there aren't very interested in the Assad government in Damascus or whatever, but long to hear about Sufi concerts, ghazals, uh, the Moorish architecture and its origin that's so much a part of California, and again have that same uh, attraction really towards uh, the other, as, as you were saying. Uh, and so I suppose uh, my, my journeys have really been voyages into the other and into trying to understand the other. Uh, and through that, into seeing how much the other has in common with us. Uh, I'm, for example, I wrote this book just now, Abandoned, about um, the Islamic world. And I think one reason I did that was that I'm of Hindu origin. And so I felt, for all my years, I've heard a lot about the Hindu perspective. And the single most important thing for a Hindu is to travel to the other side of the street and see the world he thinks he knows as it would look to uh, the person he regards as his enemy. And, and in, in those ways, um, to try to dissolve the sense of en enemy and ally. Because I think the imagination is the one faculty whereby we can work through and around our differences and actually come to that common ground. Are you optimistic that these kinds of things can translate into more material wealth for people or uh, more equality in material wealth and can translate into less war, less conflict, those kind of things? That's a good question, and because I think that is a serious problem. That in, in some ways, at a time when uh, our magazines and our commercials tell us that we're living in a smaller world and we're all part of a global village, it seems to me that the distances and differences between us are actually greater than ever before. Uh, I remember reading a few years ago that three American individuals have the same net worth as 48 whole nations of the world. And even in America, which is a relatively democratic and, and prosperous place, one individual, Mr. Gates, has the same net worth as 100 million people. So I suppose my travels have in some ways been about affirming and asserting that commonness we were talking about, but they've also told me that beneath that surface, in some ways, the differences, as you were saying, between the haves and the have-nots are increasing. Many people worry about the effect of tourism and feel that we're spoiling and destroying the cultures that we visit, and that's partially true, but I've always been um, a great believer in tourism, partly because I think we actually do bring revenue to the rest of the world, and more than that, we bring uh, information, and whenever I've been to a very closed or oppressed country, whether it's Cuba or Burma or North Korea, my sense is um, that what those people are crying out for more than anything is some contact with the rest of the world. They're living in a vacuum. Even just to know that they have a friend in Canada or America opens a small imaginative window for them. So I'm a great believer in, in trying to take what we can to those places, but you're right in suggesting that I don't think those inequalities are going to go away quickly. Um, and I, I remember a few years ago um, when the movie The Sixth Sense was so popular, and it seemed to me to speak in a small way for what's going on around the world, because everywhere I went in the world, people were watching the same movie, but it was almost as if they were, they were seeing a completely different uh, mm. film and story. Um, when I, went, when I was, saw it in Japan, where I lived part of the time, uh, people were not at all um, unsettled by the ghosts in the sixth sense, but they were very startled by the psychologists because they don't have psychologists in Japan. They have ghosts everywhere, but they're not familiar with psychologists. Um, in, I think, parts of the Islamic world, just the notion of a single mother would be more unsettling to them than anything else in that film. It doesn't translate to their cultural context. Then when I saw the movie in, in California, the big shock was just that Bruce Willis could act. I mean, <laughs> uh, and so it's as if with Titanic or Jennifer Lopez or whichever of these cultural forms you take, there's, you see them all around the world, but really each culture is translating it into their own language in a way, and so they're not seeing the same thing as us, and it gives the illusion of sameness, um, but deep down it only accentuates the differences sometimes. A good example of that would be Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, which remains a perennial bestseller in the States. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think one reason that uh, I wanted to investigate Rumi and Sufism in this book was very much my sense that he's become almost a successor to Kali of Gibran, and that a lot of people um, around me, I too maybe, would devour Rumi poems, and if we like them, we'll forget conveniently that he's of Islamic origin, or that we'll misunderstand them, that his poems, I think, which read like love poems, are really about his relation to his God but we take them as just love poems and use them to woo the girl across the table from us at the pizza joint. Um. <laughs> your, your writing is quite personal, and uh, even you know the writing that you've done, I've read a couple of essays and so forth, just about your travels, you do it kind of from your own point of view. Um, and you call yourself a Nowarian, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is something that I relate to, <laughs> having traveled all over North America in the last few years. 
Uh, we spent uh, 15 months, was it? Nine months out of 15 months in a hotel. So. Oh my gosh. Uh, being vagabonds across North America. Uh, so I, I related to that. I, I wonder if you could kind of talk about what the pitfalls are to that kind of, of life where you're always sort of moving and, and going somewhere and being mobile. Mm. And I mean, I have a sense that you're having a lot more fun at it than I did. <laughs> you know? mm. So um, you might also could talk about, you know, what, what the rewards are. Mm. In yes, I mean, I think the main pitfall, to use a variation of your word, is vagabondage. I mean, being caught up in, in that sense of perpetual motion, where you're moving and moving and moving, but you don't necessarily have a sense of direction or um, an investment in where you're going. And you're right, I think one thing that I've been interested in a lot and have been writing about a lot, uh, what I think of as the new people of the 21st century almost, who are living in the cracks between cultures, in the passageways between places, starting with my own example, because I was born in England, to Indian parents and we moved to California when I was seven. So from the time I was eight years old, I was not really Indian and not really English and not really American and really regarded that as a rare and very fortunate position to be in, that I had access to many cultures but I wasn't imprisoned in any of them. Um, and I think that makes me a sort of honorary spiritual Canadian because so many people in Canada are really in this situation much more than I. They have so many cultures inside them. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. So I've, I've looked a lot at the possibilities of these um, new kind of people who can, in some ways, look beyond the divisions and conflicts of their parents. Let's say, if, you, if an Indian grows up in India, he thinks of Pakistan as the enemy. But when he comes to Toronto or Vancouver, he, he has more in common with the Pakistani that he meets than apart, and they're brought together, actually, by their somewhat common background. Uh, uh, and so I've been interested in the way that, for example, when cabin attendant comes down the aisle passing out the disembarkation forms and they ask for very simple answers to questions where do you come from, where are you going, what's your citizenship, what's your home address more and more of us can only give essay length answers to those uh, questions so that in some ways is, is to me the good thing that when my grandparents were born and all of them were born in India not very long ago all four of them had this very precise sense they knew what their region was, what their caste was, what their tribe was who their enemies were and now many of us like me are freed from that. But the drawback, as you were, I think, suggesting in your question, is that if you're living in the cracks between cultures, you can fall between the cracks, almost like falling between the gratings and the sidewalk. You can end up neither here nor there. You end up, I think, in the spiritual equivalent of one of those airline airport passageways, long, grey, impersonal places, and you don't feel the sense of belonging. And I think the good thing about the modern world is that more and more of us get to construct our sense of identity from scratch. It's not given to us the way it was to our grandparents. But the drawback is if you don't very consciously answer the question, who are you and where do you belong, you end up totally lost. And you crave some sense of, of affiliation or solid ground beneath your feet, which you don't have. And so I, I think... For me, my sense has been that since I didn't have a physical sense of home when I grew up any time in my life, that there's a great importance in constructing some inner sense of home that I take with me everywhere I go, the way a snail does. Uh, and that can be either a person or a set of beliefs or a place you always go to. For example, um, a few years ago, I noticed that I had 1.5 million miles on United Airlines alone. And I don't even like United <laughs> Airlines. I mean, the pick and fly system is, is one of those strange things where you spend six days in hell and you get the seventh day free. Um, <laughs> so at that point, I realized, well, what I probably need most in my life is stillness. And so I began going to a Catholic uh, monastery several times a year. I'm not Catholic. But just to, to have that sense of centeredness and changelessness and have an anchor, really. And so for now, uh, 12 years, I've been going four times a year to a Catholic monastery just to make sure that I have some strong sense of, of, ham 
of, 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 well, I'm going to say family, but of community and a home, and something that never moves, even while I'm moving around the world the rest of the time. Yeah, I used to admire our cat, because we took our cat on all of these travels, mm -hmm. and the cat, every hotel room has a bed, right? <laughs> yes. And so the cat always attached herself to the bed, and it was like if she walked into the room and knew there was a bed, she was home. Yes. And it, and it, it just amazed me. Of course, it drove the maids crazy because she got very upset when they came <laughs> in and tried to make up her bed. But uh, but I always I thought I was learning kind of a lesson from her because she picked up on in ways that I didn't really the kind of commonality to all of those places yes. that we went. That no yes. matter what we stayed in, whether it was a suite or um, you know a little shack on the hole, you know a hole in the wall place somewhere on the road. There was always a bed. Yes, and, yeah. and because she was working out of instinct and following that instinct that we have too, but we sometimes forget about or argue ourselves out of that, she needs that, that homing instinct. Yes, she to root and herself. she's a pretty amazing cat because of that, because cats generally don't travel well, and she's that's right. She's gotten good at traveling. My cat so. gets sick every time she's in a car, so you're well, well ahead of me. No. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> she, she still gets sick in the car. That's why, that's why you didn't enjoy traveling as much as I did. She <laughs> took your cat along. <laughs> You've mentioned your new novel, and um, I was curious because I look back uh, over, you know, in anticipating talking to you, we kind of look back and looked at the works that you've done, and you've kind of divided your works up between fiction mm. and nonfiction. And I wondered if you could kind of put the writer's hat on for a little bit mm -hmm. and talk to us um, about what fiction accomplishes that nonfiction doesn't, and vice versa, mm. and why you chose, you know, most writers kind of pick a genre and stay in it, mm. but you seem to be um, comfortable yes. talking, uh, much like you're traveling, That's right. comfortable in different genres. It is, and it is much like my traveling, because I think it speaks to a kind of restlessness and, and interest in adventure and challenge and not wanting to stick down even to the rootedness of one genre and wanting to try something different every time. Uh, but I think uh, fiction is a way of getting at the same issues that I'm thinking about in travel, but through a different part of me. Uh, and I think the way I do it, non-fiction, I've done a lot of writing about places, about travel. And what I tend to do is go to a place for two weeks, take hundreds of pages of notes, go back to my desk, and bring the notes into a kind of order. So that I think non-fiction for me is almost a journey towards knowledge and clarity and making sense of the world. Uh, and fiction for me is a way um, to, it's, a, it's almost a journey into mystery and into a sense of what I don't know. And in this new novel, I begin in California, which is a place that I know somewhat because I've lived there on and off since I'm seven. And I move towards Iran, which is a place I've never been to. to uh, and, and in fact, in this novel, uh, I have 30 pages of vivid, fairly detailed description of Iran. And I deliberately didn't go there. Uh, before writing those pages. I've never been there to this day because I wanted to apprehend it through the imagination. I thought if I went there, I'd instantly be in my sort of travel writer's non-fiction mode and I'd take lots of notes and I'd squeeze them in whether they belonged or not. Um, so you're right to su suggest that the excitement of fiction for me is that it's a new territory. It's terra incognita. <coughs> it's a form I haven't done very much of and I don't know exactly how to do and that's part of the appeal. It's a way of looking around the corner. Um, so each time I finish a book, I want the next book to be as different as possible from the one just concluded. Uh, so in fact, I've just brought out this novel, Abandoned, but my next book I know is, uh, I've already finished as non-fiction, it's a series of travels, and the book after that will be uh, fiction. And I think it's a way to try to keep myself fresh. I don't, if I feel myself falling into my habits or ruts, I think that the reader is going to feel that sense of weariness and miss the sense of discovery that I think is where the energy comes from. So I'm always trying to shake myself up. Is there a fuzziness between the line between nonfiction and fiction? I mean, you were talking about not going to do the research mm. in Iran. Um, I wonder if, if that isn't one more thing in the postmodern world mm. that's becoming a little hard to say that's, that's A and that's B and never the twain shall meet. Absolutely. There's a great fuzziness. You're right. It's one of the boundaries that's really collapsed in recent years. Uh, I remember Paul Theroux wrote a whole series of... Um, stories about travels a few years ago and when they appeared in the New Yorker they were described as fact and fiction. Uh, a V.S. Naipaul wrote a book a few years ago called Away in the World and when it came out in England it 
came out as a, a work of non-fiction, Secrets, I think they called them. The same book came out in America, and they called it a novel. Uh, <laughs> Bruce Chatwin's books, uh, you know, and I'm now main, mentioning the three major travelers of recent years, Bruce Chatwin, Paul Through and V.S. Naipaul. Bruce Chatwin's books, too, you really can't tell how much he's made up and how much he's, he's reported, and that's part of the fascination. So you're right, and it is a fuzzy line, though I find for myself, the clearer I make that line, um, the better. And I tell myself, at least, that because I've written a lot of non-fiction about real people in real places, when um, I do fiction, I want to take a holiday from that, and I want to make, make everything up. But having said that, I once wrote a book about a year I spent in Japan and the, the woman I fell in love with and the friends that I made, real people and real events. Uh, and as soon as the book came out, I found it in the fiction section. And then a couple of years later, I wrote a novel about Cuba, and I had this horrible protagonist who's always drunk, has a terrible attitude towards women, as far from my experience, I hoped, as, as I could make it. And as soon as it came out, everyone put, took it to be a memoir. <laughs> and so it's just a little bit of a travel section. Exactly, I yes. <laughs> people were saying, yeah, how could you be a drunk all the time? I'm actually a teetotaler, but still. Um, <laughs> you, you, yeah, so even for the reader, it's unclear often. Yeah, we've often thought that... Um, the business section is always interesting to go through when you go into a bookstore because there are like hundreds of different variations of what makes a business book. Hmm. And so we thought if we ever wrote a book that we would tag it as business, <laughs> let it show up there and make it more legitimate. Uh, that's fun. <laughs> it's simply a question of putting the genre label on the back of the jacket. Yes. That's instant legitimation as far as we can tell with uh, the term business. Mm. And with travel too, actually. As long as it's another, well, any place is a place you travel to, so, <laughs> when you think about it. Mm. You've come to Victoria to be part of the Arts Festival, the Literary Arts Festival here. Uh, is this something that you do often, go to different festivals? Not so often. I'm the, the actual reason I, I'm here right now is that I came to this festival last year. I had such a wonderful time that I was really excited and pleased when they invited me back, and I, I knew I wanted to come spend more time in Victoria. But uh, not a great deal. There are writers who can almost make a profession of hopping from festival to festival these days, because, uh, which I think is a, is a very positive sign. Uh, we were just talking about it at a festival event yesterday. My sense, at least, that um, this is supposedly the age of the Internet and um, the age of visuals and TV and MTV and those kind of things, and the age of the book seems to be receding. And yet, in my experience, there's more interest in books than ever before, more good books being produced, and that a festival like this, which is just about books which are meant to be yesterday's form, 400 people will show up really interested with very searching questions, and it's a very nice affirmation. Sitting in my little desk in rural Japan, writing these books, it's easy to feel that I'm just casting them out into a black hole. <laughs> but when you come here, it's nice to, you know, people are reading books and thinking about them and getting changed by them. Do you think uh, literary festivals help local culture in any way? Definitely. I mean, I think you have a great advantage in Victoria because I suspect there are a lot of readers and book lovers here already, and the festival just confirms rather than creating that sense. But I think definitely, and, and making, reminding people that um, writers of books and books are as great a source of wisdom as what you'll find in the cineplex or what you find in TV or all the, the rival forms or what you find in the internet. Um, and I think something in the human spirit uh, is, is cries out for the kind of stories in the kind of space that only books can provide. So I don't see um, books receding over the horizon at all. And I think festivals are a nice way of sort of uh, concentrating the energy. And for me, as a writer, one purely selfish thing that I love about festivals is getting to hear all the other writers whom I never would meet and have the opportunity to listen to otherwise. So when I come to a festival like this, I spend most of my time just racing from writer to writer wanting to hear them. Great. Anything else you want to add? No, I mean, I think we, we probably covered all your... Um, ground pretty well. We appreciate your time. Oh. And taking time out during the festival. Oh, not at all. And hope you enjoy Victoria in spite of the hail. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And, and I mean, I, I, maybe the one other thing I can say is that uh, because I've written a lot about globalism and this whole new sense of community and society that's taking shape across the world, I mean, that's one reason why I love coming to Canada, because it seemed to me that Canada is more ahead in thinking about the global world than any country I know anywhere. And Canadian literature has done so much 
to try to visualize new kinds of community. And so I'm, in the US, I'm probably a little notorious among my friends as a great champion of Canada and Canadian literature. But as soon as I come here, I feel that I'm actually taking a little step into the future. And so um, the more that Canada can influence the world, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, you may or may not realize that we're from the States. No, <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm saying this because uh, we agree with you. Yeah, you, the, you uh, voted with your feet. Yes, the first thing, because the first, um, I guess, 35, 40 years of my life, I was very sheltered living in, you know, I mean, we moved a couple of times, but I didn't really get outside of the United States and outside of the Southeast United States very often. And um, coming to Canada had a lot of culture shock. You know, I, I can imagine. I yeah. sort of expected it to be um, similar enough to the states that it would feel home-like. Yes. And the very first thing that I that overwhelmed me and said, "Wow, I'm in a, I'm in a different place," is that more of the world was available to me. So much more. Yeah. That, I mean, just watching television. Yeah. Even corporate television. Yeah. I, I started hearing things and learning things about people and places in the world that just doesn't seem to get on television in the United States. So there's there's um, a myopic view of the world there. And so, you know, I haven't been a world traveler, but I felt like the world opened up to me since I've been in Canada. That's right. I think you're, you're a world traveler just by living in Canada. I actually came, I was in Canada by chance the week of September 11th in Ottawa. Uh, and I was so impressed that the kind of voices and responses I was hearing then were so far ahead of what I was hearing in America, and that's comparable to what I'm now hearing in America 18 months later, but it's as if it took America a long time to catch up with Canada. And what I also notice as a traveler, wherever I go in the world, I'll meet disproportionately 100 times more Canadians than, than Americans, whether it's South America or Asia. Uh, you meet lots of Australians and Germans and English, of course, but huge numbers of oh, Canadians. Every summer they go on holiday. Yeah, it's <laughs> interesting places, which yeah. people don't do so much south of the border. Yeah, um, uh, that was something that took some getting used to, too, is that uh, people take longer times off. Mm. In the States, it's a yeah. weekend here, a weekend there. Exactly, and, and I think well, that's a dividend. I've heard that people traveling to Latino cultures for the first time are shocked at the CS stuff. Everyone simply takes a nap for two hours in the afternoon. Mm. Uh, everyone in Canada, as far as I can tell, takes August off. <laughs> that was an enormous, mm. enormous shock. Or at least me. everyone yeah. in Victoria. Yeah, well, I, so. I think that's enlightened. <laughs> Good, well, thank you so much. Thank you. It was thank a pleasure you. meeting yes. you. Well, I really appreciate you coming in here and uh, accommodating these slightly difficult surroundings. Well, we, we hope that it will turn out well on the radio. Listening to First Person Plural. I'm Carl Wilkerson. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Pico Iyer, author of Abandon and the Global Soul. In the next half hour, Patty and I reflect upon our own travel experiences, the stories of travel, and the archetype of the traveler. The interview with Pico gave me a lot of food for thought. One of my goals is to be a world traveler, but I've often thought about that in terms of what that means culturally. Because I've been to talks before where people have presented their trips to places and have been uncomfortable with it because it seems like they don't quite get the historical perspective of Europe with the rest of the world. You mean they did the restaurant tour or they did the fake authenticity tour? Either way, they did the tour that said, I'm consuming somebody else's culture. And that bothers me a little bit. But I don't know how you can do it without, I don't know how you can travel without doing that to a certain extent. When you travel, you, even if you attempt to do it authentically, what you often get is the tour. 
Well, the mere fact of transportation, the circumstances under which you gain transportation, contextualize it somewhat. If there's not consumption going on, there's at least a meta level of some sort. Yeah. I used to work for a tour operator. This is sort of one of the things that contextualizes my thoughts about this. In the mid-1980s, for a year, I was the office manager for a tour operator. For people who don't understand what a tour operator is, it's somebody who puts together the ground transportation, the transportation to the destination, the hotel, and whatever sightseeing things you want to do while you're there into a nice, neat little package that lasts three days, five days, seven days, two weeks, whatever. But it requires a coordination of effort on the part of the tour operator and all of the people who live and work at the destination. And this nice, neat little package is not sold directly to the person who will be doing the tour. It's sold directly to the travel agent, who in turn sells it to the person who is going to be doing the tour. So it has lots of layers of bureaucracy involved in it, everybody wanting their cut. Uh, the advantage is that it usually comes out cheaper than if you were, as a single person, contacting all of these different people and asking for rates because the tour operator does, you know, 15 or 20 of these a month and they get rates discounted on the basis of their volume. But the funny part is I used to talk to all the travel agents when they would call and I would sell the packages to travel agents to talk them into selling it to other people. And they would ask me questions about Cancun or Jamaica or wherever we were selling to. And I had all of the details memorized. And I actually, at one point in my life, knew the hotel, the order that the hotels were on the strip in Cancun, like which hotel was next to which one. I could describe the outdoor area of the property the lobby of the property and several of the rooms of the property in details that made it sound like I had been there. And in fact, I was told to make it sound like I had been there. And so I fooled a lot of people into believing that I actually have been to Cancun and toured these different properties. I basically sold a narrative and sold it as if it were my personal experience. It's a fine line. I never quite said that I had been there, but I was so good at describing it that everybody just assumed I had been there and I didn't correct the assumption. Well, that's a real double-edged sword. Invariably, one does sell the narrative of one's travel, if not on the level of Pico Iyer does, then on a much more mundane level. Oh, look at our photographs of our trip to South Dakota last summer. It was so picturesque. Hence, pictures. Yes one does sell that on some level. But I was not actually selling my travel. I was selling somebody else's travel. I was not, I never actually took these trips. I've never been to Cancun. I've never been to Chichen Itza. I've never been to Jamaica. And yet I could talk about these destinations as if I had toured all of them in terms that convinced travel agents all over the southeastern United States to believe that I had been there and that I was highly recommending it. Well, I'm going to come down firmly on neither side of the fence <laughs> on this one. On one hand, first-hand accounts have a certain zest to them, a certain quality to them that I find uh, indispensable, on top of which, if there were no first-hand accounts, how would the rest of us learn anything about the empirical world? And, or, and certainly my accounts, my second-hand accounts, were based upon first-hand accounts. And of course they were, and that's the other half of it. I'm not going to say that someone who's read a book about Hawaii, for example, can't possibly know anything about Hawaii because they've never been there. I've never been to Hawaii, and at a minimum, I can tell you the capital city. And I can tell you why the Big Island is called the Big Island. So I'm going to say that both are useful and feasible. I'm not going to privilege one over the other. But do you have the feeling that both the selling of the tour and the taking of the tour 
still misses some of the culture? Yes. And uh, the extreme example would be the planned tours that the English did for quite a few years back in the old days. I can't think of a really good pop culture reference. I can, well, actually, yes, I can. Uh, if you look closely in the uh, early minutes of Tommy, the film, Oliver Reed is supposed to be a tour guide at one of these places, and Anne Margaret is visiting with her kid. And they're satirizing, if that's a word used under the circumstances, I think mocking would be a better word, that kind of tour. But that was enormously popular in the UK for a long time, and I've even heard reports that it's coming back. And that seems just mindlessly over-rationalized to us. But at the same time, one does want a guide of sorts. One doesn't just show up there having no idea what is going on. Sure. So it begs the question. And economically, it should be pointed out that the guy who ran the tra ground transport, the person who did the touring and the sightseeing places, were all locals who were making a good living in the local economy by doing this. I'm sure they were. And therefore... Some of the tourism, at least, I mean, I'm sure that for every tour guide who was available for these tours, who was making fairly good money, there were a bunch of other people who were local who were making next to nothing in order to support the tourism industry. So I don't want to mislead here. It's a complex picture. Nonetheless, if the, I mean, when tourism doesn't happen in places like this, the local economy does go down. So there is a certain amount of importance placed upon this by the locals. It's not a one-sided deal. There is a catch-22. A lot of places that make their money on tourism are selling the local culture, in effect. I can think of one right off the bat. Victoria? Yeah. <laughs> You nodded at me as if you wanted me to continue, having no idea what I was going to say. No, I knew what you were going to say. I was just going to get you to say it. Very well, and so I have. But the thing is, the packaging of the culture alters it somewhat. Yeah, like, I don't think of Victoria as merry old England, but certainly it gets sold as a taste of merry old England. And I say that having lived in the Queen's neighborhood, so... Uh, just right up the hill from where we live is the Lieutenant Governor's house, which is where the Queen stays when she's in town every 25 years or so. Continuing my use of authoritative references from British pop culture, there's an exchange in one of the Blackadder series where one character claims to be as British as Queen Victoria, and Blackadder responds, so your mother's German, you're half German, and you married a German. <laughs> I don't think anybody comes here expecting to see us running around in the streets in Lederhosen. <laughs> but the packaging of the culture alters it somewhat, and that's inevitable. One presents one's culture, and this is the proof that the presentation of the culture can be distinct, at least in one definition thereof, from the culture. Yeah, I think a real good indicator of how the power dynamics work is a very simple one when you look back at my tour operating years. The people who lived in Cancun, who worked with us on a regular basis, spoke and wrote English. I never had to learn Spanish in order to do my job. And yet, I spent a great deal of time on the, okay, this will show my age, telex machine, communicating with a number of people. I would say that I probably had communication with 30 or 40 people in Cancun. If you count all of the hotel operators, all of the tour operators, all of the ground transport, uh, we had an airplane that flew back and forth between Cancun and Chichen Itza, and I talked to them. So there was probably about 30 people that I communicated with in Cancun on a regular basis, and I never had to learn how to communicate with them in Spanish. And for them to do what they needed to have done, they knew probably more than two languages. They knew English. My guess is that they also knew French and possibly even Japanese because it was a very popular destination with all of those countries. 
Montreal strikes me as a place that is faced with this dilemma as well. My impression has been that the Quebecois speak English better than everyone else speaks French. And as much as they dislike having to do so, that's something that would come up in the tourist industry straight away. If they want people to come there from other parts of Canada, they're going to have to put up with a certain number of them speaking English. That's not a political reality, but it is a business reality, at least in the short term. Sure, and there are places in Canada that I find really interesting vis-a-vis the um, language issue. One is Prince Edward Island, which I went to on business last year, but took a day to do some touring. And of course, uh, if you're not familiar, PEI's biggest tourist destination is Green Gables. What a surprise. Yes, I can't remember the name of the town where the House of Green Gables is. This is actually fiction, but they've converted a house to look like the house in the book that you can go to and actually visit. You also can find the author's home on the map and go by and see it. And there is a gift shop on every other piece of property in which you can buy all of the red-headed, pigtailed little girl dolls that you would ever want to buy. You can find out about this in English and in French, according to the bilingual law in Canada. But if you're so inclined, you can also learn everything you ever wanted to know about Anne of Green Gables in Japanese. Why? Because every summer, huge tour buses full of Japanese tourists show up and learn everything they can about Anne of Green Gables. It apparently is one of the most popular children's books in Japan, the translation of it. And most of the people in PEI learn how to speak Japanese if they are in the tourism business. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! And one never knows when something like that is just going to happen out of the blue. I've heard it expressed that Jerry Lewis is considered a genius in France. Yeah, it's amazing to me what crosses over in cultures. I have no idea why Anne of Green Gables is popular in Japan. And I have no idea why Jerry Lewis is popular in France. But it's interesting to me that once that thing happens, however it happens, it does affect the local culture. I mean... The people in Cancun learn how to speak more than one language in order to accommodate. The people in PEI have learned Japanese in order to accommodate the influx of Japanese tourists. Or at least they've hired a translator. This reminds me of Zimmel's work about the stranger. I mean, most of the people who have talked about Zimmel and talk about the archetype of the stranger talk about it in terms of immigration and in xenophobic kinds of attitudes. But people running around the world visiting other places certainly qualifies as strangers showing up in the local culture. And certainly in the same way that Zimmel asserts that the stranger is in fact not outside the social realm, but rather is a part of what makes the social realm social, certainly the tourist does that. I mean, I'm not sure that you can, I mean, maybe you need a second archetype called the tourist, I'm not sure. But I think a lot of the same things apply. The locals know who they are in comparison to who the tourists are. Uh, I certainly experienced this growing up in Florida. In Florida, we made jokes all of the time about tourists. We made jokes about the snowbirds. We made jokes about the Europeans who came to the beach. 
you know, you could tell who the tourists were because of 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Locals were running around with a sweater on and people from Canada were running around in shorts. There was a sense of who us was and us being people who lived and worked in Florida and the and the sense of who they were and that was people who came as tourists to Florida. I'm sure that's true every place that has a significant amount of tourism, at least the understanding that there are the locals and there are the tourists and that there's a certain front stage backstage split in the behavior. Definitely. I want to ask two questions. One, is that inevitable? And two, if a metropolis decides to accept or pursue the tourism angle as a matter of public policy, implicit or explicit, is it not limiting its ambition to being exactly that, if it is inevitable, to wit? Is the metropolis not determining at that point that its culture in the future is going to consist of that front stage, backstage behavior, that the limit of their ambition is going to be saying nice things to the tourists and complaining about them enthusiastically behind their backs, but always taking their money. There's a sort of pettiness glass ceiling yeah. that manifests itself. Gee, is it inevitable? Well, I guess not, because at some point or another, decisions can always be made both in the front stage and the backstage that change the dynamics. Certainly, to take an example, in New Orleans for a very long time, tourism was the major industry. And then they discovered offshore oil. And that changed the dynamics quite a bit. In 1984, after the big oil boom of the 1970s, when the World's Fair came to town, they had to spend a lot of time teaching locals on how to deal with tourists. And that seems very odd, I imagine. But the tourism industry sort of got set aside during the 1970s in New Orleans as everybody got rich off of oil. And so the next thing you know in the early 1980s, in anticipation of this big influx of tourists, there were charm schools held for the New Orleans taxi drivers because they were considered so rude that everybody was afraid that it would turn people off from New Orleans. So they actually gave them protocol training. Yeah, in order to renew your hacker's license in 1982 and 1983, you had to go to a class that taught you how to be polite to tourists when they came and to represent the city in the best light. And I mean, let's face it, tourism was an old industry by that time, but it was obvious that the front stage dynamics had changed. Sometimes that lack of protocol is inadvertent, and sometimes it's anything but. One of the things that I noticed living in Florida was there were two kinds of people there, according to one taxonomy, those making money off tourism and those not making money off tourism. I saw more than one bumper sticker that said, Welcome to Florida. Now go home. Yes. And there was a kind of, especially with the snowbirds, especially in the winter when the population got much, much larger, there was a feeling that something from the outside was taking over rather than being invited in. And there were certainly a number of people who felt like, okay, we have enough. That's it. We only want so many people to come visit. We've got enough now. Now, the rest of you, go away. And that heterogeneity is probably the norm. We've been talking about the locals here, and I want to point out the possibility that not all localized cultures are homogenous. Yes, and I want to, in addition to that, once you invite tourists in, something has to change in the local culture. It can't remain the same. I mean, that's Basically what Zimmel is suggesting is that once the stranger enters the picture, it changes the social dynamics. So in answer to your question before about once a municipality decides to make tourism part of the local economy and pursues tourism, it changes the local culture. It changes the local economy. 
So if you're going on a trip and you're wondering about how to take part in the local culture, you don't have to worry about it. The mere fact of your arrival will ensure that you have done so. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.